If you don't have a sermon outline, I'd like to ask you to just simply slip up your hand real quick, and these guys will be glad to give you one. This morning, our preacher is one of the young men in the life of our church, a young man who's grown up here um, with uh, his mom and his dad and his precious sister. The Chipman family is a fixture in the life of this church, a very, very good fixture, a, a wonderful blessing to our church. Um, Tommy Chipman is our church administrator. And uh, his wife is one of our principals in our high school at Sheridan Hills Christian School. And uh, TJ uh, is their son who has just graduated as valedictorian of Sheridan Hills Christian School. Amen. Praise the Lord. He has been um, one of the young men that have grown up hearing the Word of God from his mom and dad and in the life of the churches where they have attended, both um, here in Florida, but also in Utah, in various places um, uh, where they've lived. And uh, TJ has given his heart to Christ um, through belief in him. And um, I want to encourage you to listen as he challenges us in an important way. TJ is about to go off to school in Louisville, Kentucky, to Boyce College, which is also where a few others are that is associated with Southern Seminary, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. And so he will be going there and studying along with uh, Tommy Morgado and others um, in the life of our church that are headed that way. But would you please welcome to this pulpit this morning, TJ, and listen with glad hearts. Before I begin, I would just like to say how honored I am to have the opportunity to stand before you all today and preach my first sermon. Uh, For the last four years, I have joyfully sat among you under the faithful proclamation of the gospel from this very pulpit. So I would like to thank you all as my church family for constantly pointing me to Christ and helping me grow closer in my relationship with him. It is my hope and prayer this morning that the Lord would use me for the glory of his name. A few weeks ago, I and many others all over the country celebrated a very special day. It was the day in which we graduated from high school. I understand that for many here, the word high school may seem to be a very foreign word. Maybe it's been quite a while since you were last there, but perhaps you can still remember what this day was like. For those like me, who are really quite young and inexperienced in life, this day was a big deal. It was a big deal for it marked the end of one stage of life, namely adolescence, and the beginning of a new one, adulthood. Some of you who know me may know that by God's grace, I was given the opportunity to give a speech at my own graduation, and perhaps you were even there. Where some see this time as an opportunity to try to impress their class or maybe inspire others to go and change the world, I saw this as a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with others. I mean, what better opportunity could you ask for? My classmates and their families were all here, and and they were forced to hear me speak in order to graduate. So, perfect opportunity. So that's what I did. I gave a speech and with the intention of challenging my classmates and their families to consider Christ and their relationship to him. Uh, Little did I know at the time that God was actually preparing me to give my first sermon. Uh, Last Tuesday also marks another very special day in my life. Uh, Last Tuesday was the day in which I almost had my first heart attack. Um, I got a call from Pastor Andrew and about lost it when he asked me if I wanted to preach before heading off to college. Uh, And so, in my moment of extreme excitement and fear, I gladly accepted this opportunity. Uh, But the reason why I bring up my graduation speech is because, in a sense, this sermon comes directly from that speech. So for those of you who are at my graduation and may have heard me speak for the first time, forgive me, but you're going to have to hear it again, (laughs) but longer. But though this sermon is an adaptation of the original speech, I do believe that what we are about to consider this morning is important for everyone to hear, from the most mature of believers, even to the unbeliever. So this morning, I want us to consider the big picture of life in regard, excuse me, to our relationship 
with the triune God. So first, we will consider the big picture of our lives in light of our relationship with Christ. Then we will consider the new life in Christ. And finally, we will consider how this new life is to be lived out. First, consider the big picture of our life. Second, consider the new life in Christ. And third, how this new life is to be lived out. But before we begin, let us pray. Lord, we know that unless you build the house, the builder strives in vain. Unless you watch over the city, the watcher watches in vain. And Lord, unless you come and speak to your people this morning, the preacher preaches in vain. So Lord, I ask this morning that you would send your Holy Spirit to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Help me to be faithful to your word and clear in what I have to say. Work in the lives of each and every person here and use your word to glorify yourself. Pray this in your name. Amen. So first, and if you have your outline, go ahead and fill it in. Let us consider the big picture of life. Let us consider the big picture of life. And just a forewarning, this is going to be by far the longest point, so don't get worried as we're nearing the end. Um, but as I stand here this morning and look out at the many different faces in the congregation, I am reminded of how blessed our church is to have such a wide variety of different people. There are some here who have been walking with the Lord for many years, even through various trials, and while there are others here who are still brand new to the faith. There are some who are still in the very beginning stages of life, and whereas there are also others who are nearing the end of life. But with such a wide variety of people, all who are at various stages of life, many different questions are bound to be raised, aren't they? Questions such as, what school am I going to go to? Who should I marry? What job should I take? What stock should I invest in? What house should I buy? When can I retire? And you name it, the list goes on. Many of us, I'm sure, have put a lot of thought into these questions, and some maybe more than others. And while we may even think that we have a fairly good idea of what we're going to do with our lives, I'm sure that there are many here who can attest to the fact that none of us truly know what is to come. In fact, I'm willing to guess that there are many in this room who, looking back, can say that life really didn't go the way they expected. Perhaps you are thinking, if only I knew what life would have in store for me, maybe then I would have done things much differently. The truth is, Life is quite complex, isn't it? Yes, we know that God is in control of all things, but that doesn't necessarily make things simple, does it? You may think you know exactly how your life is going to unfold, or maybe you're like me and you, simp you think you have a general area of where you're going to go, but at the end of the day, your plans and my plans are not set in stone. Now, before you accuse me of saying that having plans for the future is wrong, let me clarify that what I'm trying to get at is not that it is wrong to have plans for the future. But rather, what I'm trying to say is that ultimately, our lives are completely dependent upon God. In other words, if you are, in other words, you are not sovereign, you are not entirely in control of your life. You do not have the final say of what is to come. I believe a passage that illustrates this well is Proverbs 16, 9. And so if you would, I believe this is on your bulletin. Let us look at it together. Proverbs 16, 9 says, the heart of man plans his way. But notice the second part, but the Lord establishes his steps. Notice that the verse does not say that having plans is wrong. In fact, the verse kind of implies that man is already moving forward to make plans before the Lord establishes his steps, doesn't it? The picture seems to be that in order for God to establish man's steps, man must first be walking. So having plans here is not necessarily a bad thing. However, the main idea that the verse is putting forward and what I'm trying to get at, and you can fill this in, is this. No matter what our plans are, in the end, God must be the one to establish our steps. No matter what our plans are, 
in the end, God must be the one to establish our steps. He is in control, not us. So I'd like to ask you this morning, what are your plans? No, I'm not asking uh, what your plans are and who you're going to grab lunch with after church today. Rather, I'm asking, what are your plans for the big picture of your life? What are the plans for the big picture of your life? Is it to be successful at work? Save lots of money, settle down, have a nice family, retire young, upgrade your house, upgrade your car, the American dream, perhaps. Or maybe you're the type of person who doesn't plan at all. Maybe you simply just like to go with the flow. Do you fall into any of these categories? Again, I don't want to come across as if I'm trying to say that all these things are wrong, but I do want to be extremely clear that if this is all that you care about, namely your comfort, then you may be in a very dangerous place. Are these things more important to you than your relationship with God? I believe that there are many people who go their whole lives living in relative comfort while maintaining a somewhat moralistic lifestyle and go to hell because they never saw a need to repent of their sin and place their faith in Christ. Friends, if you are not careful, these things may take you to hell. And if you're the type who just likes to go with the flow, well, I hate to break it to you, but you're not safe either. Where do you think that flow leads? Scripture makes clear that the way is wide that leads to hell and narrow that leads to heaven. So I urge you this morning, check yourselves. What is your ultimate plan in life? One of the things we often tend to do in our fallen and sinful nature is we tend to make the things in life that are least important most important, and the things that are most important, least important. In other words, one of the things, and you can fill us in, one of our greatest problems is that we tend to prioritize the wrong things, don't we? Just out of curiosity, how many of you here were the type of student who would procrastinate in school? <laughs> Perhaps you would keep putting off your work in order to make room for other things until finally, at the last minute, you were forced to cram it all in. Is this not a problem of prioritizing the wrong things? Or maybe you weren't the type to procrastinate. Maybe you did fairly well of staying on top of your assignments. And so let me give you another scenario. You're driving to work one day, and suddenly, right as you are nearing your destination, your car suddenly begins to violently shake. So you slow down and you put on your hazards and cruise into the parking lot. And sure enough, you notice that your check engine light has suddenly turned on. But since you are already at work, you decide, meh, I'll just figure it out later. Turns out that figuring it out later actually means saying it, setting it aside day after day until finally the shaking becomes so unbearable that you are forced to get your car looked at. And as the mechanic hands you the bill, you about lose your balance trying to grasp how in the world your payment could be so expensive. And then it dawns on you. If only I would have had it checked out earlier, maybe then I wouldn't have to pay so much money to get it fixed. For those of you who are wondering, yes, this may have happened to me, uh, but never mind that. Um, <clears throat> but this principle of prioritizing the wrong things is true for many different aspects of life, isn't it? I'm sure you can think of many other examples in which we tend to mix up our priorities. But doesn't this also affect how we treat our relationship with God? Think about it. How often do we prioritize other things over our relationship with Him? Now, I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, and I'm sure you probably know the answer already, but the question is this. What is the most important question that anyone can ask themselves? What is the most important question that anyone can ask themselves? Is it not, how do I stand before God? Is not our relationship with God the most important thing in our lives? And yet we so often live our lives as if this doesn't matter. 
Do you see the error in this? And as Christians, we know that there will be a day in which we will all have to stand before our maker and give an account for what we have done. So I beg of you, don't run from this question. Don't prioritize the here and now over how you will be spending eternity. You may think to yourself, I have time. I have my whole life ahead of me. I'll just continue doing my thing now and get all this straightened out later. But friend, my response to you, and more importantly, the Bible's response to you, is Galatians 6, verse 8, which says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows from the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. In other words, you cannot fool God. God is not mocked. Those who sow in the flesh, which simply means those who continue in their sin, will from that sin reap corruption, not eternal life. Do not be deceived. The longer you continue saying no to God and yes to sin, the harder it becomes to say no to sin and yes to God. The more you make this a habit, the easier it gets. When I was a freshman in high school, no, this was not last year, it was four years ago, uh, one of my mentors, some of you may know him, a man named Tommy Morgado, gave me a little book called Thoughts for Young Men by a man named J.C. Ryle. I remember when he gave me this book, I looked at the front cover, and after seeing this portrait of this old dude with a big old beard from the 1800s, I decided to place it on my shelf and not read it. Uh, but two years later, sure enough, as I was cleaning out my room, this book and I once again crossed paths. This time, however, instead of setting the book aside, I wiped off the thin layer of dust that had slowly been accumulating on the book over the years, and I decided to give it a read. And what I read blew me away. Though this book was written in the 1800s, it was as if this guy somehow looked into the future and knew exactly what to write for young men in my generation. In a section entitled, What Young Men Will Be, in All Probability Depends on What They Are Now, Ryle gives a startling illustration. He says, and I quote, Habits are like stones rolling downhill. The further they roll, the faster and more ungovernable is their course. Habits, like trees, are strengthened by age. A boy may bend an oak when it is but a sapling, but a hundred men cannot root it up when it is a full-grown tree. If you do not seek the Lord when young, the strength of habit is such that you will probably never seek him at all. In other words, the longer you wait to come to God, the more difficult it becomes. The more you say no, the easier it gets. But before we move on, I also want to affirm that in God's grace, there is no one too far gone that he cannot save. There is no heart too hard that the Lord cannot remove and replace with a heart of flesh. But the principle remains, do not go on thinking that you can come to God on your own time. Come to him now. For all you know, you may not have long. Furthermore, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. No matter how young you are or how physically active you are, your life is ultimately outside of your hands, is it not? So therefore, instead of continuing in your sin, turn to him who is in control. A few years ago, our church spent a considerable time studying the book of James, and perhaps you can still remember. One of the passages that I remember Pastor Andrew preaching on so vividly is James 4, 13 through 15. In it, James writes, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and make a profit. And listen to what James has to say to these people. Yet you do not know what tomorrow 
will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. The Bible affirms in multiple places that our lives here on earth are short. We are like the morning dew that covers the field, but is gone by noon. Indeed, all flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Isaiah 46 and 8. Yes, in the moment, it may not feel like our lives are but a mist that appears for a little while, but then vanishes. But I am sure that there are many here who can agree with that statement. One of my mentors, Bob Rose, once told me that it feels as if the older he gets, the faster life begins to go by. And Bob, I'll take your word for it. Uh, But in all seriousness, is this not true? Friend, your life will go by faster than you realize. So please, don't get to the end and realize that you've wasted it. Come to Christ now. Yes, God can always save you at the end of your life. He can save you on your deathbed. But do not let this be an excuse to go on sinning apart from surrendering to him. The verse makes it clear, and if you, if you are following along in your outline, underline it with me. You do not know what tomorrow is will bring. You do not know what tomorrow will bring. For all you know, today could be your last. This year could be your last. So seek the Lord while he can still be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now I want to be extra clear, and if you're going to get anything from this sermon, may it be this, that when I ask you all to consider how you stand before your creator, or when I urge you to seek the Lord now, I'm not asking you to work harder. Again, when I ask you to get right with God, I am not calling for you to do better. Friends, the gospel message, the message of the Bible, is not a call to work harder so that God will somehow accept you. The message of the Bible is not a call for you to work harder so that God will somehow accept you. Rather, is that you cannot do it. And not only can you not do it, but you've already failed. And you continue to fail, day after day after day. The Bible makes it clear that apart from faith alone in Christ alone, there is no hope for salvation. You see, God created us in order to enjoy perfect fellowship with him and to worship him in all that we do. Yet the entire human race has fallen short of that calling. Perhaps some of you know Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Instead of worshiping and enjoying him, our only source of true joy and happiness, we have all turned away from him to other things instead. Things which cannot satisfy our souls. Do you know what the Bible calls this? The Bible calls this sin. And because God is holy and just, he will not allow sin to go unpunished. He cannot simply sweep your sin or my sin or anyone's sin under the rug. So then we are all faced with a predicament. Are we not? We are under God's just wrath for our sin and we have no way to make ourselves right with him. Isaiah 64, 6 says that all of us stand before God as one who is unclean. And all of our so-called good works, our righteous deeds, are but filthy rags before God because of our sin. So the picture is this. To try to make yourself right before God apart from faith is like trying to scrub off your filth with more filth. It does not work. But friends, the good news is this. God does not leave us here in our desperate state. But instead, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to rescue us from our sin by serving as our substitute. He 
was perfectly obedient to the Father on our behalf. He took the punishment for our sin upon himself. And three days later, he rose again, conquering sin and death. That is good news. So now, through repenting of our sin and placing our faith alone in Christ's work on the cross, we receive the forgiveness of our sin and his perfect righteousness. That is good news. So taking the gospel into consideration, the answer to the question of what we will say to God when we stand before him is not to say, look at all I've done, Lord. Look what I did. That's not the answer. The only answer that we will ever be able to give is this. I have nothing to offer you except that Jesus died and that he died for me. So if you are here today and have not repented of your sin and turned to Christ in faith alone, do not ponder this question any longer. Run to him. Run to him now. He said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Friends, come to Jesus and he will give you rest. Hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Run no longer. Come to the only one who can bring you lasting peace and satisfaction. He is waiting. But do not tarry, for this offer will not always be available as it is now. Now, if you would, let us briefly consider our second point. And the next two points of the sermon are going to be considerably shorter. And the second point is this. Consider the new life in Christ. Consider the new life in Christ. Now I want us to look more deeply at what happens to a person at the moment of conversion, or what happens to a person when they repent of their sins and place their faith in Christ. But before we begin, I'd like to give you all a pop quiz. Pastor Lucas once asked us in a sermon a simple question. He said, in what way does the New Testament most often describe believers? In what way does the New Testament most often describe believers? Understandably, our go-to response is probably the word Christian. But actually, as he explained, the New Testament hardly ever uses the word Christian. In fact, at the time, the word was most likely an insult to believers but the way the New Testament most often refers to believers is this, and you can fill it in. The New Testament most often refers to believers as those who are in Christ. Those who are in Christ. I'm sure if you begin looking for these words, you may begin to start to see them all over. But what exactly do they mean? What does it mean to be in Christ? Well, the New Testament seems to assume that all those who are trusting in Christ's work for salvation, namely his life, death, and resurrection, are united with him. So let us look at, briefly look at three ways in which we are united to Christ through faith. First, we are united to Christ in his life. Second, we are united to him in his death. And third, in his resurrection. So first, life, second, death, and then third, resurrection. So first, we are united to Christ in his life. We are united with him in his life in that unlike us, Christ perfectly lived a life of obedience to the Father on our behalf. And we see in various places of scripture, the Father, in referring to his Son, says this, this is my beloved Son, in him I am well pleased. So now all who place their faith in Christ and are united with him are said to be clothed in his robe of righteousness. We are given his righteousness. 
And we see this in Isaiah 61, 10. Also, look at me, look at with me, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And it says this, For our sake he, that is the Father, made him, the Son, to be sin who knew no sin, so that, and then underline it, in him we might become the righteousness of God. Notice again the words, in him. It is only through this union with Christ that we receive his perfect righteousness, a righteousness that is not of our own. In other words, this righteousness is not earned. It is given. And not only are we united with Christ in his life, but we are also united with him, and this is B, in his death. Paul writes in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so we see that those who are united with Christ have also been crucified with him. He took the punishment for our sins in our place, namely the eternal wrath of God, so that we would not have to. So what is the benefit of this aspect of union with Christ? It is this. Now, having been united to Christ through faith, the Father no longer looks at us and sees our sin. Because we are in Christ, and only if you are in Christ, the Father can now look at you, and instead of seeing your sin, he says, I will remember your sin no more, and your lawless deeds no more. It's Jeremiah 31, verse 34. And lastly, we are united with Christ in his resurrection. We are told in 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 23, for as in Adam all die, so also, and here it is again, in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So in other words, just as when we were still dead in our sins, which the passage calls in Adam, all who are in Christ, all who belong to Christ, will also be raised from the dead with him to everlasting life. So now, having looked at what it means to be in Christ, let us move on to our third and final point, which is this. How this new life is to be lived out. How are we to live this new life? In other words, how can you take what I've said today and apply it to your life? The first and most obvious way is to right now, if you have not already, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or, in other words, turn from your sin and place all your trust in the work that Christ has accomplished on your behalf. Friend, would you this day humbly and sincerely look to Christ as the only one who can save you from your poor and wretched condition? May it be today. Secondly, we know that for those who are in Christ and who have already placed their faith in him, we are called to live our entire lives for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In the past two weeks, we have looked at the Great Commission, uh, that call for all believers to go into all the world and make disciples of Jesus, and we saw that as a Christian, as one who is in Christ, you are called to follow Jesus and to help others to follow Jesus. Whether that is one who is already a believer or an unbeliever, or whether that is here in your community or in a foreign land, we are called to make disciples of Jesus. So I want to make it very clear that the way that God has intended for this to be done, discipleship to be done, is through membership in the local church. The way we are to practically fulfill the Great Commission and live our lives for the glory of God is in the context, fill it in, of the local church. That is, whether you remain here in South Florida or whether you go away to a foreign land, we are to fulfill this 
in the local church. Christians, God did not create us to live our lives solo. Rather, he designed for us to live in community with one another. There is no such thing, biblically speaking, of trying to live your Christian life apart from the fellowship of the local church. In fact, is it not true that to call yourself a Christian is to say that you have been united with Christ and are therefore a part of his church? And does not Christ love his bride? And friends, his bride is the church. So if you do not love his bride, why then should you be accepted before God? As a Christian, do you not want to be surrounded by fellow like-minded people who love and worship the same God that you love and worship and believe in the same truths that you believe? Do you not want a family that will rejoice with you in times of joy and then come alongside you in your greatest hour of need? Furthermore, we know that as Christians, we are not called to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds through God's word. So how then are Christians to grow? Mainly through a healthy diet of receiving God's word, through discipleship, and through accountability. And God designed for us to receive these things in and through fellowship of the local church. So do you see the importance of becoming an active member of a local church? I hope you do. Maybe you've only been occasionally attending Sheridan Hills for many years now, but have never made yourself known or taken the next step to truly become part of this church. Friend, simply coming every Sunday does not mean that you are part of this church. As one who was once in your very position, let me urge you to attend our next upcoming starting point. But in the time being, will you make yourself known? We would love to get to know you and build a relationship with you. Or maybe you're here for the first time and have never been a part of a local church. I encourage you, stay, come, talk to one of our pastors at the end of service. They would love to speak with you. Help us to help you follow Jesus better. Perhaps you already are a member here and you have signed your name under the church covenant, but you have not been faithful. So let me ask you, are you being faithful in the discipleship of others? Who have you been discipling? Who is discipling you? Can I encourage you to be more committed to this body of believers? Finally, for those who are already members and who are faithful, can I ask you to reach out to others who you may not know? Help them to feel welcome. Encourage them to become more faithful in church membership. And now, be, before I close in prayer, and since we are talking about how to live out the Christian life, I would like to leave you all with a question from an old catechism. And for those of you who may not know, a catechism is a tool of teaching people through the use of a question and an answer. And the question I want to leave you all with is this. What is your only comfort in life and in death. What is your only comfort in life and in death? And here's the answer. My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied all my sins, delivered me from all the power of the devil, and preserves me so much that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a single hair can fall from my head. Do you belong to Jesus? If you do, rest in him. And if you do not, may this be the day that you do. Let us pray.